Life is an amazing podcast and it is presented and hosted by myself, Caro, and my sweet dog, Sparky. Give it up for him. I hope you're ready. Enjoy. And welcome, dear people, to Go For Your Life. So this is part of my Vegan Hero series. Um, and one of the people that I'm interviewing is Keegan. He's right here with me from, where are we talking from, Keegan? Like we're having a... I'm, I'm in Sedona, Arizona, United wow. States. Hey, that's, that's really, it rhymes as well. It's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Sedona, Arizona. Da, da, da. It's like a song. Um, so yeah, as part of the series, I already spoke to Giacomo. I'm also going to speak to Alex. They're all amazing uh, vegan filmmakers. And I'm very honored and very grateful that Keegan and I are having this conversation. So thank you, Keegan. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, it's so cool to. Uh, it's also really nice to uh, to connect. Because um, are you so? Are you working at the moment uh, right now? Yeah, yeah. So I am producing um, four films currently. Whoa! I'm yeah, thankfully I'm only directing one of them. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm a writer and producer on three other films currently, and so I'm super busy, mm -hmm. which is kind of how I. I've operated for the last eight years making films. I've, <laughs> I've pretty much always had two projects going at the same time. Like mm -hmm. I, I'll start a new feature film before I finish the current one. And that tends to be because, you know, doing feature length documentaries takes so long mm -hmm. that I start to, I, I miss that creative spark that happens when you first start a project, mm -hmm. when you first, when you first come up with an idea and a concept and you start outlining and storyboarding it that's a really exciting part for me. And so, um, yeah, the current film I'm working on is called Hungry for Justice. It's about food justice and food access in the United States and mm. asking the question, why is it that um, Americans of color suffer from disproportionately higher rates of chronic disease than Caucasian Americans? Mm. And so the film follows my co-director, John Lewis, who's uh, known as the badass vegan online, mm -hmm. uh, following his, his story and his journey, trying to find answers to that. But we're doing that whole film through the lens of hip hop and urban culture. So we're interviewing mm. influential hip hop artists and musicians and athletes and entertainers. Um, so cool. We're talking about this issue because yeah, we knew the, the impetus behind it is that music has influenced my life. You know, I became mm -hmm. vegan and straight edge because of hardcore punk music and music is, is this incredible tool for shifting culture. And there's really no other art form like hip hop in the way it can, you know, transmute information and influence communities. You know, what a hip-hop artist says, wears, drives, eats, drinks, talks about, influences the purchasing power of millions of people mm. around the world. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's arguably the most influential art form in human history. Mm -hmm. And so when hip-hop artists start talking about conscious eating or plant-based diet or just being aware of, you know, that the food we are, you know, marketed towards and that have really pushed on particularly communities of color in the United States – that when artists talk about that, that could really shift the culture in a major way and could mm. save millions of people's lives from preventable diseases, but also just shift how we look at government and society mm. and pharmaceuticals and the whole nine yards. So it's a really powerful, exciting film. Um, mm -hmm. And we hope to have that out yeah, in 2020. Ah, so cool. It sounds really amazing because for those, I mean, I think everybody knows, but for those of you who don't know, Keegan is behind like Cowspiracy and What the Health and um, those movies you did with Kip, right? Like mm -hmm. you, you guys were working uh, together and was, was Cowspiracy one of the first movies you've done or like how did you, where did it start for you? Yeah, so Cowspiracy is the second feature-length documentary I did. I had done a film the year before I started working on Cowspiracy called Turlock. And Turlock is a feature-length documentary about the largest animal neglect case in California history. It's the second largest in U.S. history, hmm. uh, second largest animal rescue in U.S. history. And it, what it was was a, a battery egg farm, you know, this concentrated factory farm, tiny little cage, wire cages for that they raise hens in for their eggs. The farm abandoned 50,000 egg laying hens in these cages for two weeks without food. Mm. And so a neighbor started to complain about the smell because there was birds, you know, just rotting in the cages. And I was uh, one of the first people on the scene and went in and started filming. And we, it ended up being a campaign to try and save these animals because the county that was in control of disposing of the animals, 
didn't want us to save any of them. And so mm. there was a police standoff. It was a whole thing and ended up making a feature film about that. And so it's, it's a heavy film, but it's ultimately it's beautiful. It's about the 4,500 chickens that we were able to save and, mm. and how they live the rest of their lives out. Um, and while making that film, I actually met my now wife. Um, <laughs> she was one of the rescuers there. So it's a vegan love story. And <laughs> when, when I finished that film and it premiered, I was looking for projects and, um, Kip Anderson, my co-director for Cowspiracy with the Health, he heard about it and reached out and said, you know, that he'd been trying to make this film for a while. And we got together. And from the first time we met to the time we finished the film was 10 months. Hmm. We just busted it out as quick wow. as possible. Wow, yeah, wow, it was wow. super, super fast. But part of that was we had a very, very small budget. So we were trying <laughs> to get it done as quickly as we could for that. But also the the urgency of it. You know, Cowspiracy is, for those who haven't seen it, is a film about the environmental impact of animal agriculture and mm -hmm. why large environmental organizations aren't talking about it. And the more research we did while making that film, the the more destructive and more damaging than we ever thought animal agriculture possibly could be. And mm -hmm. it was revealed to us. And so that was a really powerful film. And, and while we were doing that film, we... Um, realized that there there was a whole other story around health. Mm -hmm. And we were going to actually include it in Cowspiracy, like a big health section. But we realized it was two separate films. And so we did yeah, What the okay. Hell. Wow. Okay. Yeah, so right What the Hell was kind of like born within Cowspiracy. Like you guys were already. Oh, that's really amazing. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. And, and did, so. Did you ever oh, think ahead. Cowspiracy was going to be as big as it gotten in the end? Like were you were you, were you ready for that? You know, I I, I kind of did think it was going to be an imp like have a big impact. I didn't think it was going to get. You know, we ended up having Leonardo DiCaprio be an executive mm. producer on the film, which that no, I never thought that was going to happen. <laughs> um, and you know, it's one of Netflix's most successful documentaries. Yeah. And yeah, no, I I thought it was going to make waves, and I thought it was going to wake people up, but not in the way that it did. I mean, the film was shown at the European Union Parliament, mm. um, the Italian Parliament. Dutch parliament. I mean, it was been shown around the world to world leaders. Um, but, you know, I think a big part of that was, yeah, having Leonardo DiCaprio on board, mm -hmm. it legitimized the film. You know, the film's called Cowspiracy. So for a lot of people, that's like a conspiratorial film and you know, who's inter yeah. interested yeah. in conspiracy films. But, you know, I'm, I'm into conspiracy theories that are true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. And how um, did and you so guys then, get Leo, Leo uh, on board? Yeah, our, our good buddy Leo. The it good was, Leo. It was just amazing. Um, <laughs> Lisa Lange at PETA, she gave a copy of the film to Darren Aronofsky, who's one of my favorite ah. directors. He mm -hmm. did um, Noah and uh, Requiem for a Dream. Mm -hmm. And he, he saw the film and apparently told DiCaprio about it and said, hey, you got to see this film. And so we, I get a call. I'm driving over to Kip's house, and I get a call from this guy, and he goes, hey, you know, I'm a right-hand man to Leonardo DiCaprio. He heard about your film. He'd love to get a screener. <laughs> and I kind of laughed like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure you are. <laughs> and I, and I go to Kip and I tell him, I'm like, Hey man, this guy said he's like works for Leonardo DiCaprio and wants a screener. And we laughed about it. And, I, and, I, and Kip's like, yeah, yeah, send him a screener. And he's like, yeah, it's a creative way of trying to get a free version of the film. He's like, we, you know, we're not, we're not cheap. <laughs> like we'll, we'll give somebody a version of the film. So we sent it to him. And a week later I get a call from uh, Jennifer Davison, who is Leonardo DiCaprio's producer. She's worked on Mm -hmm. She's a producer on Revenant and almost all of his films. She's a producer on it. And she said, hey, Leo saw your film. He's obsessed with it. That's all he's talking about. Wow. He, yeah, he had a meeting with a bunch of people and showed it to them. He called up the heads of Netflix himself, which is normally he would never do. <laughs> He'd have one of us do that. And he uh, said, hey, you guys got to take this film. I'm going to be an executive producer on it. And this is before he even talked to us. And so we said, <laughs> awesome. Um, wow. And then over the course of a year, we re-edited the film and mm -hmm. tightened it up, um, updated the facts and statistics. Because sadly, over the course of the year that we were working on yeah, it, the course. situation just got worse. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, the the if he did it produce an exclusive version for Netflix. So there's wow. a, a version that's on Netflix around the world um, in, gosh, it's probably 40 languages at this point. Mm -hmm. And then there's the version that is on the DVD and that we sell through our website. Yeah, and right. The, the Netflix version is just more updated and and just a bulletproof film. Mm -hmm. Wow, and and so because um, this was something that I was talking to with Giacomo as well is that he really learned it all by himself, and you you were the same, right? You didn't go to any kind of film school or anything like that. You really are a self taught um, yeah. filmmaker in a way. Yeah, I'm I'm a sixth grade dropout, so I only made it to. <laughs> 
normal <laughs> school until I was 12 years old. Wow. And yeah, a total self-taught in, in the sense that I mean, people ask me all the time, they're like, well, where did you go to film school? And I said, YouTube University. Yeah, you, you, know? yeah, you, and, you and I had joked about that. It was so yeah. funny. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, literally, yeah. this all, you just you go on YouTube for whatever you want, and there's someone who's taken the time to do a tutorial for you. So mm. I've really used those resources. And then, yeah, just taught, learned as much as I can. And I think learning through doing is one of the best ways, at least for me. Like, that's, mm -hmm. that's where I get my information. And what are some, like, major challenging, challenges for you while you were, like – learning it uh it f for yourself and then doing it for yourself um probably the biggest challenge is i didn't realize you have to be like a computer nerd to make films <laughs> you gotta you gotta know about you know ram and processors and non-linear editors and there's there's so much technic technology that's involved you mm -hmm. know, a lot of people i think just think of filmmaking as a camera and a story yeah but there's so much technical information and knowledge that you've got to gain and so yeah i mean at this point it's like i'm a total gear nerd because you <laughs> have to be yeah. um, at least at least the way i do it you know because with all of my films i've sh written shot edited produced i've done the score for most of my films um yeah. So I really had to know every single process, which I'm really fortunate that I've been able to do that. And I'm thankful that I've been able to do that. I would like to not have to do everything for my future films. <laughs> and is, was there a situation in your life like where you were like, because you, of course you're a vegan activist as well and your veganism is so important to you. But was there a moment where you're like, okay, I'm going to make films now. This has to happen. And then you started doing it or like, was it an event that really sparked that in you? Yeah. You know, I, I would spent um close to eight years as a touring musician with the music project called true nature hmm. um and and i the whole point of true nature was to raise awareness about animal human and earth liberation like that's what all the songs were about mm -hmm. and every show was about creating conversation and getting dialogue and getting people to think about these issues but i found after years of doing that frustrated like i was only reaching so many people mm -hmm. and the reason why i chose music was music was the reason why i changed my life um, and I started thinking like, well, what's another way you can reach a lot of people and what's had a big influence on me was documentaries. And so I started teaching myself documentary filmmaking and I, and I had an organization called Rescued, which was doing investigations into factory farms because I thought we really need to produce as a, as a movement, produce high quality investigative films. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's tons of, of really powerful investigations, but that's really grainy footage and it's, you know, really hard to watch because just visually it's hard to watch and mm -hmm. then obviously emotionally. Um, and so I wanted to step step the game up when it came to investigation. So I was doing HD, you know, videos and just trying to yeah make things as more cinematic as possible. More to the kind of animal equality, I think, or is doing that sort of investigations. I think they really started that higher quality. Mm -hmm. And from there, I went from investigations to doing short videos for nonprofits, and very quickly went into doing feature lengths. And as soon as I saw the impact that videos were having on people, I, I decided like, that's, that's it. Like that's mm -hmm. where I'm going to have the biggest impact. And then with the success of Cowspiracy was a hundred percent, like this is what I need to be doing. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the last eight years has been nonstop films, you know, just back to back to back to back. Yeah. And, and, um, do you, so, so is there also some, some kind of magic or some kind of like amazing chemistry between you and Kip? Like how, how do you look at that? kind of you know your you you your work as a duo with him like how is that yeah super fortunate um working with kip you know i i hadn't worked with a lot of people before and kip and i worked really really well together kip's uh, an extremely creative guy tons of ideas tons of different concepts and so i mean honestly like the biggest challenge with working with kip was just reining in like the incredible amount of ideas and creative thoughts that he had mm -hmm. um and yeah kip's still one of my best friends super fortunate we i decided not to do um after we finished what the health i started i did another film on my own called running for good which is a yeah. feature length documentary about fiona oaks a mm -hmm. four-time world record vegan marathon runner i decided to do films uh, independent from from kip because i just wanted to have the total creative freedom to just do things as artistically as possible mm -hmm. that i you know felt moved to do 